behalf of Metabolon, I'd like to welcome you to Dry Blood Spot Cards Analysis on Metabolon's Precision Metabolomics Platform. My name is Carolyn Waite. I am the host and moderator for today's event. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to provide some brief instructions. The presentation has been muted, but we welcome questions that can be answered during the Q&A session at the end. To submit a question, please open the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. They are... Annie Evans, PhD, Director of R&D at Metabolon, and Kelly Goodman, Senior Research Scientist at Metabolon. Welcome everyone. Annie, the presenter role is yours. Thank you very much, Carolyn, and thank, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as the title suggests, I'm gonna be talking about the analysis of dried blood spots and metabolomics analysis. This is a brief overview of the agenda we'll be going over today. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the technology. Essentially, it's just an underpinning of the technology that we use when we are analyzing DBS. And then I'm going to pass the presentation over to Kelly Goodman, who is really going to be focusing on the DBS side of the analysis. She's gonna be sharing some of the work that we did in both biological validation of the DBS cards, as well as how this compares to plasma, in addition to the analytical validation that uh, work that we did. And as Carolyn mentioned, we will have time at the end. So please start putting any questions you have in the chat um, and then we will answer them at the end. So just as a high level introduction to Metabolon, Metabolon was incorporated in 2000. And so for greater than 20 years now, we have been doing metabolomics analysis, which means we've had the opportunity to explore metabolic studies with over 500 diseases identification of over, um, or sorry, uh, looking for over 5,200 metabolites, um, as well as you know, 700,000 biological samples, tens of thousands, uh, 10,000 projects, and 2,000 publications. Now, all of those numbers are really just highlighted to really show our experience in this field. In addition to that, we are also certified. We are ISO certified, as well as CAP and CLIA certified. At the core of Metabolon's offering is a real focus on quality. And in fact, it's one of our mission, it's part of our mission and part of our goals as a company is a focus on quality. Um, and so as a result, we are audited and people come in and look at our technology all the time, just to make sure that the data that we are producing is the most accurate and reproducible possible. And that is obviously incredibly important to us as we are helping investigators like yourselves to really you know, move science forward. And so quality is obviously a huge part of that. So at a really high level, why metabolomics, right? Metabolomics is a really unique omics because it actually takes into account many of the factors that are influencing the state of our health today. A lot of people, um, I love to use the analogy that um, if you walk into your house and your house is, it's winter right now, so it's freezing cold. So you'll say you walk into your house and it's really, really cold. You are not gonna pick up the blueprints for your house to try to understand why your house is cold. You know, you're gonna see if the power is still coming from the power company. You're gonna see if all the windows happen to be open, right? There are all these other factors that are going to have a much more profound effect on how that house is feeling right now, very far away from the blue. So along the same lines, why is it when we are studying diseases is the first place we always think to look at the genetic code, right? Now that's not to say that our genetic code doesn't have a profound effect on our health, but there are many other factors that contribute to our health. And metabolomics is a unique omics in that it captures those other factors in the same space and same analysis as capturing our genetic code. So examples of this are things like microbiome influence and lifestyle and environment exposure. So if I ran anybody's plasma right now, I would be able to tell you, for example, if you drank orange juice for breakfast, or if you had been fasting for four days, um, or if you had um, you know, a healthy microbiome or not. For example, we can know that we can distinguish between a healthy microbiome and a deplete microbiome by looking for signatures in the blood of any given individual. So you don't necessarily even need to look at the stool to understand what is going on in the microbiome. Those are signatures that can be readily seen in the blood. So in this one analysis, in this one omics, you can capture a tremendous amount of information about the state of, an, of, 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 of health of an, of an individual or a, you know, a test model. And in addition to those other factors, you also get the output of the genetic code, right? You also get all of our sort of endogenous biology and whether we have mutations that are causing us to not process a specific molecule effectively as we need to be or overproducing molecules, right? So it is this unique omics in that it captures all of that. 
So for that, we like to think of, you know, genomics is sort of this concept of understanding the risk of a disease, whereas metabolomics is really about um, where it is today and the status. But that's not to say we are at war with genomics. And in fact, the two together or any of the omics brought together become really synergistic. One of the things that we have done a lot of work with is in GWAS studies where we have worked with epidemiologists who have these large patient populations where they've done genetic profiling of these patients. And then they've also run metabolomic studies on these same patient populations. And then what we've been able to do is take genetic mutations, correlate those with metabolites, and one, identify those mutations that are actually penetrant mutations, but also start, start to identify those genes that are of uh, variants of unknown significance. There are multiple publications out there really showing that you can have a gene where the function is unknown, but it correlates so highly with say something like carnitine. And then you can go do some um, you know, follow up research and understand, oh, that's, that's a carnitine transport excuse me, transporter. So it's not that they're at a war, they feed information. And so metabolomics can actually enrich the data um, on genomics that may have already been collected. Now, unfortunately, being the analytical chemist who has to be responsible for detecting these wealth of small molecules um, in a sample, it actually is somewhat of a challenge, right? So if you look at the list of molecules on this slide, it is an incredibly diverse list of chemicals with very different chemical properties. And just to give you sort of a, a line in the sand, in something like human plasma, we can typically detect and identify between 2,000 and 2,500 um, small molecules. So um, that is an incredible diversity of molecules. And so the only way to be able to detect that breadth of diversity of molecules is to run multiple methods. So this is the metabolons uh, pipeline, if you will, for how, um, how we process these samples. So one of the things that I love to highlight here is that sample prep is the first part of this, but what we love to do is interact with investigators before they are even to the point of having designed their study. One of the things that we know about metabolomics and science in general is that one of the biggest issues that can lead to a failure of a study is improper study design or inappropriate controls having been used, right? Or even things like the tube that you picked had inappropriate contaminants that confounded the result, right? So one of the things that we love to do is talk with our uh, potential investigators very early on in the process because we have lots of recommendations and even provide in some matrices tubes and we'll send you tubes that we know to work very well. Uh, so again, it's really important uh, to try to make sure that you've got an appropriate study because if the study is going to fail, it's because of study design and not generally because of the samples being used. With that said, um, the samples come into Metabolon and we will, um, we will do the extraction ourselves. Now, just to give you a little bit more information on that, this is a fairly typical small molecule extraction and that we use methanol to, do, um, to remove all of the macromolecules. So we are crashing out RNA, DNA, uh, proteins, um, you know, oligosaccharides, those sort of molecules are crashed out of the solution. And what we are left is a supernatant of the small molecules. We then that divide, that, um, divide that extract into multiple aliquots, and then those aliquots are run over four different analytical methods. Now, again, in a little bit more detail, the four different analytical methods are both broken up into two positive ion mass spec methods and two negative ion mass spec methods. Again, certain molecules prefer to ionize in positive mode and some in negative, so that helps us increase our ability to detect a different sets of molecules. And further um, divided, each of those methods are also broken up into hydrophobicity of molecules. So we have a method that looks for more hydrophilic positive ions and more hydrophobic uh, positive ions, as well as the same thing on the negative. Again, just to increase the scope of um, the molecules that we can detect. The data that comes from this is actually, there's quite a bit of data. Now, when you think about big data in the world, this data is not as complex as some of the other data streams that you've heard about, but it is still it needs to be handled with care. So one of the things where, uh, one of the assets to Metabolon is our bioinformatics approach. And I'll describe this um, in the next slide where we have actually go into detail of the benefits of using the methods that we use. But just to sort of finish off the pipeline here, the data that comes off of the instruments is heavily QC'd. There's data reduction, there's library identification. Um, and again, a lot of QC. Part of that is because of our, our CAP, CLIA, and ISO certification is, again, demonstration of quality before anything can move on in the, in the pipeline. 
And then the final step of this process is the interpretation of the data. And again, I'll highlight this a little bit towards the end, but this is just the idea of mapping these molecules that we're detecting to, to particular biological pathways so that we can start to understand what is actually happening in these samples and be able to recommend you know, next actions. So I wanna take this one slide to talk about that bioinformatics approach that we utilize. So again, mass spec data is quite rich on these biological samples. We are detecting about 150,000 peaks or features in a single sample. Now that does not mean I am detecting 150,000 compounds. Mass spec data, unfortunately, is pretty rich with um, noise. Now some of that noise is adducts and artifacts and sort of redundant signatures in the mass spectrometer. Um, and some of those are things like um, phthalates that are coming from the plastic tubes that we are using, right? That are not of biological or origin. So there's a lot of data in there. So you essentially have this very large signal to noise problem. And Metabolon's approach has been that the best way to handle this is to search all of that data uh, against an authentic standard library in order to allow us to rapidly categorize the source of all of those peaks and features. So what we have done is we have purchased um, over 5,400 small molecules. And we've actually had to synthesize a significant portion of those because one of the things that we know is we are still learning about all of the things that, that are in a human uh, or in a human sample, all the different things that we're exposed to, all the different processes, chemical processes occurring into our body. While we think we know everything that's going on, we really don't. Um, and so we have had to synthesize a lot of these molecules because they weren't known to exist in humankind uh, before we started looking in these samples. So again, we run these standards, we document where they elute, so the retention time, their mass, all the features that they produce, as well as their fragmentation pattern. Now, because we have this library, it becomes a simple issue of taking all these features that we detect, searching them through this library and immediately identifying and simultaneously deconvoluting all of that peak data into those metabolites that are present in the sample. This has the benefit in as well as that ultimately we are going to take the time to identify those molecules that are changing in a study, as well as those that have maintained uh, homeostasis that have not changed a result of the study. And that could be really important when you're looking at a biological study to be able to see like, oh, this enzymes pathway is uh, perturbed, but this pathway over here is not, which helps give you more confidence in your interpretation of the data. So only after this data reduction step does the data then enter into statistics? This has the big benefit of reducing false discoveries. So one of the other approaches that other lab practitioners or other people doing metabolomics use is to simply send all of the peaks into statistics. The problem with that is that you have a much higher fault number of false discoveries, right? Statistics has a concept that the more measurements go into stats, the more of those are going to be false discoveries. By cleaning up the data ahead of time before statistics, you have a much lower number of false discoveries, which is obviously just going to save time and effort for everybody. So I mentioned the interpretation step. After we have gone through the process of identifying these features, and again, I haven't had time to talk about all the quality control processes that we use today, just trying to keep this part of the talk succinct. Um, but the last part of this is really the interpretation. And in all honesty, um, there is a limitation, I think, in our current education system that we've sort of lost the, you know, the, the scientists of the world that were biochemistry experts, right? So what we have found is that Many investigators get this incredibly rich list of metabolites, what's going up, what's going down. They don't know how to interpret that data because they've lost sort of a fundamental understanding of all the different biochemical reactions that are happening in the body. So they take that metabolomics, they put it in a metabolomics data, they put it in the drawer and say metabolomics didn't help me. And that's really unfortunate because it's, it's simply a lack of availability of good tools to help and really that fundamental knowledge of the diversity of chemical properties and chemical reactions that are occurring. So one of the things that Metabolon offers is interpretation of this data. We have a fleet of PhD biochemists who have been doing metabolomics analysis and really looking at the output of metabolomics data for 20 years, right? So they know signatures, you know, these molecules are going up and oh, those are going down. Oh, I see a shift towards omega oxidation or, um, you know, oh, these molecules are going up and those are going down. Oh, that's a sign of kidney dysfunction, right? So they know what these signatures mean. And so instead of just looking like a huge table of molecules going up and down, they know the actionable insight of what those things mean. 
And so they can provide that information and really immediately make this data much more actionable. So in full disclosure, the interpretation is an added cost, but it is almost invaluable, I think, to what it brings to our clients in terms of helping them move forward faster in their research when they can have, again, that immediate um, uh, analysis of what that data means in the terms of their research. So that is all I wanted to talk about for that sort of high level of the background of our technology. Now we're going to start, why you're all here today is to talk about dried blood spots, right? So interestingly enough, we started the research into dried blood spots several years ago, four, probably three or four years ago. And it was through discussions with clients where they either were unable to support traditional cold storage needs. That is sort of the bread and butter of most scientific studies, right? You collect a sample, you freeze it in minus 80, you ship it on dry ice. And for some practitioners that just wasn't possible. I remember one of the earliest discussions we had was with, um, uh, with the Veterans Association of America. One of the things that the Veterans Association is responsible for is monitoring the health of all veterans. But what they were finding out is that some of their veterans lived far enough away from VA hospitals that they couldn't monitor the veteran. The veteran couldn't make it into the hospital to get tested, so they couldn't maintain or monitor the health of that veteran. So they were incredibly interested in finding strategies which would allow that veteran to, in their house, collect their blood, stick it in the mail, ship it to the hospital, so that they could actually maintain, um, you know, and know that the veterans were maintaining their health. Um, so really this idea that, um, you know, easier collection, something that can be done at home, um, but also low income, um, you know, talking about one of the other, um, uh, work that work that we've done in dried blood spots with was an incredibly low income area in Mali, um, where it was a dietary intervention model. So obviously children in Mali have, uh, you know, obviously significant uh, malnutrition issues. And a lot of this is because of dysbiotic um, functions in their gut. Um, and it's obviously leads to incredible disease and, and, and delayed development in these nations. And so one of the hopes was, is that using this dietary intervention would help these children prosper. Well, they couldn't have samples stored in a minus 80. And in fact, the cost of the blood spot cards, the Wattman 903 cards were too expensive for them. They actually had to cut the cards in half. Uh, so again, you're talking about very, link, very low income and more um, you know, marginalized populations that by having this sort of dried blood spot alternative, it opens up research into areas that would previously have been not possible. So the dictate, the, the mandate there is that these samples can be stored at room temperature. Uh, Kelly in her, uh, in the rest of her talk is gonna talk about, you know, all of the different temperature storages and validations that we've done. So you'll be able to hear about the outcome of that. Certainly a finger prick is a lot less invasive than a venous draw. So there's a lot less risk associated with doing a fingerprint to collect a blood spot than there is with going in with a phlebotomist and taking a blood draw. There's a lot less blood taken during a finger prick. You know, a venous draw, you may be taking, you know, five mils of blood, whereas with the, with the finger prick, you're, you're maybe talking 50 to 100 microliters. So you're also using much smaller amounts of blood. And that's particularly applicable when you're talking about doing animal research um, or when you're talking about children research, right? It, it's easier if you can do it with a finger prick for sure. But then finally, the important thing was really to confirm that we could get sufficient coverage um, in DBS to be able to support accurate biological conclusions, right? And again, Kelly is going to be talking to you about this research where we were very passionate about making sure that we didn't just wanna make a simple solution. We wanted to make a solution that was still gonna drive accurate biological conclusions. And that was obviously key and most important to us. So that's all I wanted to go today. I'm going to hand this over to Kelly now. And again, she is going to talk about um, our validation of the dry blood spots um, in more detail for you. So Kelly, you're on. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I was saying, uh, I'm very excited to share with you all the validation work that we've done uh, to get dried blood spots launched um, at Metabolon. And so I'm going to be going over, you know, uh, like Annie mentioned, you know, we know so much in plasma. Researchers really, some of them really want to know how does it compare and, and can I use dry blood spots in place of plasma and will I, how much will I lose or gain? So we're going to be comparing the metabolic profiles of the two. 
Um, and so the correlation of metabolic signatures that we've shown from a fed fasted study with matched um, dry blood spots and plasma collections. Um, and then we're gonna go into another study that we did uh, in-house. It was a longitudinal study. And from there, we were able to use the metadata collected from in-house donors and confirm these biological findings that we know are present in plasma and confirm them in dry blood spots. And then I'm gonna go over the analytical validation results with precision, uh, detection limits, and the stability results at different temperatures. And so first, <clears throat> I wanted to just start by showing you uh, what we do at Metabolon to extract the dry blood spots. We have validated dry blood spots on Wattman uh, protein saver cards. We take two six millimeter punches, one from each spot and combine them and extract them uh, for a single sample analysis. So that does require that we have two spots um, per sample. And we estimate that there's about 22 microliters of whole blood in those two punches. And uh, Annie uh, alluded to the difference in the extraction volumes between plasma and dried blood spots, you're getting about a quarter of the volume in a dried blood spot extraction as compared to the 100 microliters that we extract for plasma. And here's an example of the, the collection area on the dried blood spot card and the minimum uh, sample size. So for the spot to, in order to punch a six millimeter punch. And like I said, we take one punch from each of these two spots. And so this is, we're gonna start by showing you the 49 donor uh, fed fasted study we did in house. This was in our biological validation to show com the comparison of the compounds, and here we're showing the super pathway compositions of the two matrices. You see that the pie charts are very similar. We have all of these super pathways uh, detected in dry blood spots, as we have in plasma. Um, and the compound counts here on the right, um, I've shown that were used in these plots you'll see first the numbers are quite lower in the dread blood spots. Um, right here, we used a conservative detection limit. The compound had to be present in 70% of the 49 donors. And so that was just to make a more direct comparison between the two. Um, we do typically see 700 to 900 compounds in dread blood spot cards, depending on the study. But these numbers shown here are represent, you know, the biological diversity across people, um, especially in the xenobiotics. Um, this is why you're you're just seeing fewer compounds shown here. But we use this detection limit uh, to to make a good comparison of those compounds that are routinely detected. And I will say that no matter what the detection criteria we use, the compositions, the relative proportions of these super pathways was basically the exact same. So the plots would not change if the detection limit was, was different. So I've highlighted a couple of the super pathways that actually show the compounds that are more present in the red blood cells, um, the cellular component in dried blood spots. So you're getting uh, more nucleotides, carbohydrates, also energy metabolites uh, have a higher response in dried blood spots and very good precision as well as cofactors and vitamins. So very good precision as compared to plasma. And not only are the super pathways all present, but in one way or another, by a compound or even different compounds, 94% of the 100 so subpathways in plasma are represented in dried blood spots. So even with these 
fewer compounds detected in dried blood spots, they're still covering all of the pathways and, and most of those subpathways. And we also use these uh, biological validation data from the study to compare the metabolic signature of fasting status by correlating the fed versus fasted ratios in dried blood spots versus those in plasma. And we took the 50 most significant markers in plasma, 31 of which were also significant in dried blood spots. And here we have an R squared of 0.87, which is fantastic. But also because of that cellular component in dried blood spots, DBS has a unique signature. And, and so 80% of the top 50 markers in dried blood spots were significant in plasma. So that means there are that 20% that are unique and, and also showing a metabolic signature for fasting uh, that was not significant in plasma. And to finish off our biological validation, 15% of the 850 compounds in the dried blood spots did show this metabolic signature for fasting. And even though we, the, the 49 donor fed fasted study was focused on fasting, uh, the signature for fasting, we decided to look at Z scores. And over here, we're showing the Z scores for two diabetes markers. And right here, we're overlaying the, in the red is the dried blood spot results, uh, Z scores. And in blue, we analyze the plasma on four different platforms. So although it's slightly confusing, um, these blue letters are just the different four platforms the plasma was ran on. And here the, they, the Z scores are overlaid and you can just see them lining up perfectly. So when you have this, this one individual, very much an outlier um, in, in both of these diabetes markers, they're outliers for both the dried blood spots and the plasma. And we, so like I mentioned, we did an in-house longitudinal dried blood spot study where we had 22 Metabolon volunteers collect their dried blood spots at home uh, for 30 days. We asked them to collect during the week. Uh, they had an option to collect on weekends they had options to do pre and post exercise and they recorded everything that they did um, with everything they ate. I gave them this giant packet to fill out uh, every day so along with their health history. And so from there, we did uh, use these findings to see what we could see in dried blood spots that we know in plasma. So right here, I'm showing you just the beautiful longitudinal precision uh, in dried blood spots. And so longitudinal precision within an individual. Each color represents a different donor, and this is over the 30 days. And so you just see this really great straight reproducibility representing our homeostatic regulation of these metabolites in our body. And not only that, but you also see the biological diversity. So across individuals, you do see separation, which is exactly what we want to see in, in these studies and what we know occurs. So we, we did want to see this in the dried blood spots and we did. And also, you know, this was, these are just a few examples. This occurred across all the pathways uh, many more metabolites. And also uh, we do see this metabolic fingerprint uh, within an individual. And so unique to individuals, we have, you know, this incredible precision, which we would not have, without that, we would not have been able to see these outliers. Um, each of these different box plots is a different donor. And you just see these across pathways, these outliers coming out. And that is 
also signifying, you know, their individual fingerprint. And so one person actually decided to fast for four days and drink only water um, on, on their own accord. Uh, and so what this is showing you is something very interesting and what we would expect, but it was very nice to see in the dried blood spot samples that this donor in purple over the 30 days, um, we see you know, some of these metabolites, we see these increase in branched chain amino acids, stress biomarkers, um, you know, stressed out is not eating. So, um, and ketone bodies, these are things we expect from plasma that we were able to confirm in the dry blood spot samples. And you also see sort of a delayed response. Um, so where it says water only, those are the days they're taking, drinking only water, and then you see it come back down. And that's the, the regulation and coming back to that homeostatic stase, uh, stasis. And also some of them are delayed. Um, you know, you have water only um, on a couple days where nothing happened, but then, but then that metabolite did increase. And that was just really interesting to see and, and good to confirm in a dry blood spots. And so in the, meta, in the metadata, we did ask them to record any nutritional supplements they were taking. And this one is fish oil. And, and so for those that said, yes, I take fish oil, each color is a different donor over the days. And so we do see a separation there. Um, interestingly, these two uh, days popped out for that donor. And they decided to do a experiment, which they did not disclose to us that they actually likely took <laughs> fish oil on those days, but it was B represents their, their second collection on that day um, as, as sort of their experiment. So from here, we can see they probably took fish oil. Um, and then also we used the, um, the amount of fish oil that they were taking that they recorded. And you can see that uh, the, the 1200 milligram dose is higher than the 1000 milligram dose. This one donor apparently took a low dose and a high dose. So they may me metabolize this differently, but um, all in all, it was very interesting to see and use their metadata to um, to see what was going on with the nutritional intake. And pre and post exercise, um, eight donors, you know, decided to do this. So we were able to confirm the TCA cycle uh, intermediates that we expect to change uh, with post exercise and tyrosine metabolites uh, to name a few. And one of our favorite ones was when we were looking at the data and we saw um, just some really irreproducible uh, numbers coming out. And we're like, what is going on? And so we're looking at our own data and then we start plotting it. And we do see this just perfect cyclic nature of these progestin steroids, um, these reproductive hormones. And then we were able to break it out using the metadata that, you know, different types of hormones that, pe that the women were taking and then males on the side and, and a couple women uh, having gone through menopause, flatlined, but it, it really broke down perfectly based on their um, hormones they were taking or not taking. And Interestingly, these ones that were a little off base from their group happen to have a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, which does affect their hormone levels. Um, and so that's just something we pointed out uh, and, and it helped explain the data and, and the results that we saw. So now I will go over the analytical performance during our validation. Um, we 
did a complete validation. Um, we've written a 90 plus page validation report explaining all of this, but I will uh, only dive into the precision sensitivity and stability results. But it is important to highlight that we tested a lot of variables uh, from process contamination, dilution of the spot, spot homogeneity, um, that's the dispersion effects of the blood when it when it hits the card and dries, and uh, which is influenced by spot volume and and then the effects of punch location, whether you punch the middle of the spot or the edge of the spot. We tested hematocrit effects and, of course, the dried blood spot versus plasma. And so we were able to detect usually at least 750 compounds per run day, uh, up to 850, um, and then at least over 550 compounds uh, were able to be bridged across multiple run days, ran months apart. And so that's a bridging using our dry blood spot QC uh, that we run in every, every batch that we do. Um, and precision is very similar to plasma. We get a median RSD of less than 10% for our all endogenous biochemicals in our technical replicates of our QC. Less than 5% of the compounds have CVs over 30%. And that's fantastic and very similar to plasma as well. And I will have a few extra slides about stability, but to summarize, 95% of the compounds are stable and, and or stabilized by the third week of storage uh, at all temperatures, even at room temperature. So we did a short term stability study, a one month, we tested these samples at one day, uh, a weekly, basically, uh, for one month. And so what you're seeing here, focusing on the green uh, sections, these are the percentage of compounds of the 500 plus that were completely stable. They showed no signs of change over the one month. And even at room temperature, 70% completely stable. The blue portion shows the compounds that did show a change, but this change occurs very rapidly within the first, you know, one to two weeks, uh, some of them out to three weeks, but they then stabilize, they reach this plateau. So they, they have an effect and then they stop changing. And that's about 15 to 25%. So when you include those, and after that three week of stabilization, the red portion is the number of compounds that do show some stability effects, but that's less than 5% regardless of temperature. So even at room temperature, only 5% of compounds are changing and continue to change after that three week period. And we did a long-term stability study out to seven months. And we'll say we are still using our QC sample uh, that was prepared in 2017. So this is uh, about four years uh, and it is still performing very similarly to it did in the first year. But what we wanna emphasize is that as long as samples are stored and collected consistently within a study and they are analyzed after this three week period that I mentioned, at which point the compounds, 95% of them stabilize and remain stable, um, there's no reason you can't run a study at, at room temperature. Uh, what does happen uh, we do recommend that samples are stored and shipped as cold as possible to avoid or minimize the change in response from that from that first time point. So as you as your temperatures get warmer, you do have this increase in the the change in intensity from the initial prep. 
but again, as long as all of your samples are, are stored in consistently at room temperature or minus 20 and, and analyzed after that three week period, you will have no problems uh, running your study. And this is another uh, plot of, of a single um, diacylglyceride, I believe. And so the blue line uh, moving down is uh, the blue line is minus 80 degrees. And this is showing the percent change from that sort of gold standard minus 80 day one. And the gray, you can see this decline um, degradation of that compound, but that only occurs within the first 12 days and likely very sooner, but the 12 days was our next time point. And then it flatlines, that's that plateau. So I just wanted to help you visualize what's happening. <clears throat> so to summarize um, our metabolomics analyses and dried blood spots, Dried blood spots uh, is a great option to use when plasma is, is hard to collect. Um, you know, storage is not practical. You can't have minus 80 degree, you know, storage in Africa often. Um, so dried blood spots is a very uh, great option. And biological signatures are maintained in dried blood spots as we showed but they are also different matrices. Um, so while many are biomarkers are shared, there are gonna be some unique ones to each matrix. And we, we wanna keep exploring that and, and explore how, how we can determine different signatures in dried blood spots that you won't be able to see in plasma. And one of the most crucial points is consistency in collection and storage uh, will give you the best data. We recommend storing and shipping as full as possible. Um, but again, room temperature, acceptable, but keep it consistent across the samples. And in our uh, ISO 9001 launch we did last year uh, for dry blood spots, we went through a number of um, you know, ways to make it easier for clients to prepare samples that will give you the best data. And so please reach out to us uh, for these tips and tricks. We have collection guidelines uh, that we'll gladly share um, and able provide you um, a way to give us the most um, acceptable spots that will give you the best data. And also coming soon, we have a Dread Blood Spot blog that will be posted on our website. We also have uh, white papers coming out in the next month uh, where we will explain further detail on dried blood spots versus plasma. And um, also a stability white paper um, that's involved in that analytical validation. So please look out for those. Um, and those are those papers are would be able to be referenced um, when when needed. So thank you very much. And uh, Carolyn, are there any questions? Thank you, Kelly and Annie. Everyone, if you have any questions, please just write them down at below in the Q and A. So first off. Um, you are CLIA certified. What are the parameters or clinical benefits that can be done on a very large population? And are there differences when using DBS samples? Uh, I can take that. Um, so certainly one of the benefits of, if you think about doing a clinical trial, the expense of the clinical trial is the first thing that always comes to mind, right? And part of that is because of the, you know, the expense of hiring doctors, having a clinic, uh, having phlebotomists come in and draw samples. So I think one of the big advantages of dried blood spots when you think about large population clinical analysis is cost savings, right? Um, because now again, you've opened up, even if, even if you decide you want to have the patient come into a clinic, it is a much lower, um, uh, lower risk for the client, uh, sorry, lower risk for the participant in the trial, as well as you can have, you know, a nurse or a technician be the person to assist the person in the blood draw. 
or all the way to assisting the, the members of the trial to do their collection at home, right? So there's huge benefits to think about using DBS in, in sort of the clinical side of things or in any time you have large populations of people, it's just gonna make ease and save cost. In terms of differences you might see in the data, again, I think Kelly has covered that really well and sort of the biological validation. These are not the same matrices, right? Plasma and whole blood, or sorry, DBS are different, right? DBS has cellular content in it that plasma does not. Um, so that actually means you may see some signatures that are, are new signatures you wouldn't have been able to see before if you had just run plasma. Um, I think the biggest limitation is just that because we are extracting a smaller volume, we are seeing, you know, slightly less representation of molecules. And when we've looked at this, um, and Kelly can correct me if I'm wrong, it's not been like, you know, one pathway hasn't been killed because of DBS. It's more just a systematic decrease of the loss of those molecules that were at lower level, even in plasma. And because we're extracting a lower amount, we simply can't detect those. But I see no reason to hesitate Again, I'm always one, Isaac, if you can use plasma, if you've got the capabilities to use plasma, I would say go ahead and use plasma, right? You are gonna get better biochemical coverage, but DBS is a fantastic alternative if you know you wanna save some resources, money, or you're in a population um, where getting uh, people to a clinic is, is not feasible. So um, I guess that would be my soapbox of, of how this could apply to large cohorts or clinical trials. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, sorry if I missed it, but has Metabolon done some sort of temporal QC? Uh, this question specifically asked about plasma, but maybe talk about some DBS and plasma. And then they also add, if so, do you see any bias in a loss of particular metabolites? Okay, so yes, we do create a dry blood spot QC. Um, we have prepared a bulk uh, prepared QC, which means we purchase a pool of whole blood and prepare um, a bunch of spots at once, hundreds, and store them in the freezer. And then we pull out the cards when, the, and when we go to extract each batch. And uh, so, do we see, and, and so we do a similar a thing with plasma. We have a big pool of plasma and we extract that in every batch and that allows us to bridge to different um, studies and batches ran uh, weeks apart. Um, do we see a loss of compounds over time? So that, that ties into our long-term stability study that we did, um, at least for dry blood spots, um, also with plasma, but with dried blood spots, that initial, you know, one week after prep is when the majority of any stability issues might occur. And so after that time point, I, I did show the, the one month, you know, it stabilizes, but that that's true for out to seven months and plus. We've been using our dried blood spot QC since 2017 and have not seen any changes um, over time. So it's still perfectly acceptable. Um, and so that's what uh, we use in every batch. Thank you. Um, do the concepts of targeted versus untargeted approaches still apply for DBS? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's actually a really long and great history of targeted assays and dried blood spots and, you know, every infant born in the U.S. is it has a, a, what, a slew of, of tests of inborn errors of metabolism that they are getting tested for, and that's with uh, a heel prick, and they collect it on the dried blood spot. So absolutely targeted assays are going to work fine in DBS. Now, Metabolon has not validated um, any specific assays that we have in targeted assay, but I expect that there would be no issue with running targeted assays in DBS, um, very similar to the, you know, the, the data that we're seeing from the global, the global detection methodology. Um, and going back to you, Annie, as you had touched on this earlier, are you doing any DNA RNA extraction from the DBS? And how much 
quantity or quality are you receiving from these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in our extraction method, uh, we do a methanol uh, precipitation and that does crash out all the macromolecules and actually we throw them away. So I know to some people that's an absolute crime, right? But um, so we don't track or monitor, you know, was the RNA stabilized? Um, how much RNA or DNA was present in that spot? I simply do not know. Like my gut instinct says that certainly RNA is not gonna be stabilized, um, but I, it, the, the most accurate answer is that I really don't know. We never look at that and we don't test it. So unfortunately I, I can't answer that question. Okay. Um, and then Kelly, how long can a DBS sample be stored at room temperature? Okay, so along the same lines, um, our long-term stability study showed it can be stored at least seven months. But again, all of our data proves that that initial couple weeks is when the um, compounds are changing and then they stop changing. Um, so some are degrading into other compounds, but but have a sort of limit and then and then stop and plateau. So once that change has occurred within the that three week period, we expect samples to be stable well beyond seven months, um, up to years and years. So we've actually ran, like I think Annie mentioned in the beginning, was a study from Mali, Africa, where these samples were stored at room temperature for over three years and we were able to get great results. Um, we're looking forward to a paper being published um, from those data soon. So yeah, you know, we do recommend storing at as cold as possible just to get that, you know, more accurate um, biological uh, value, you know, what would be present in your in your sample um, with minimal changes, but as long as your, your controls and all of your study samples are collected and stored the same, whether it be at room temperature, we, we expect great data to be able to be provided um, out many years at room temperature after that three week period. So the first analysis would be after that three week period. I think the only thing I might add to that is we have seen like not only temperature, but humidity control is really important as well. I know one of the things that we ran into was that the samples might have been at room temperature, but they were not humidity controlled and that will actually degrade the material of the card itself. So one of the things that we put in our um, uh, sample collection storage uh, uh, documents is to have the storage stored with a, stored with a de desiccant um, because again that will start to break down the fibrous material that is the card and it can be hard to then get a good punch so um, you know I think I would be almost more concerned about humidity control than I would be about um, temperature control because as long as again temperature is consistent you're going to still be able to get some good data if a card is falling apart in your hands because of humidity exposure that's going to be tough. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and like I mentioned in those um, that last slide, we have a lot of resources for you. If you choose to collect dried blood spots, please reach out because um, there are some many uh, very important points, uh, tips and uh, storage. Like she said, desiccant is crucial, um, but all of that is, is readily available for you. Thank you both. And it looks like this might be our last question. If anyone has any questions, just add them below in our Q&A section. Um, Kelly, you had mentioned that we had validated this on the Wetman card. Are there any other types of cards that can be used? Yeah, so uh, we have tested a bunch of um, different cards and devices and we see promising results from them. Uh, as long as your samples are collected all using the same card. Um, there's the Allstrom, you know, but we did decide to go with the Wattman 903 card because it's the most readily available, most widely used. Um, and we, we decided on that one for full validation. So the caveat is that we have not validated on any other devices, but we can provide some information um, if anyone is interested in different devices, we've tested many of them. So we, we have some knowledge there that we can provide. 
and that would be acceptable. Um, Okay, it looks like that is it. So Annie and Kelly, thank you very much. Everyone else, thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope that this has been very educational for you. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you everyone.